Um, I do want to talk a little bit about, about cyber risk because this we see this a lot now. Um, so uh, I'm sure you get the emails all the time, right? So the spoofed emails. So it looks like it's coming from the CEO or the CFO. It sort of has some information that would suggest it's coming from the CFO or the CEO. And it's asking you to do something, you know, wire some money, um, generally wire some money, uh, you know, for this purpose or that purpose. Um, but it's it's a spoofed email. It's not really the, the CEO or CFO. I'll show you one, one very big one that happened. Um, the, the third one is, um, the way companies are structured, they have, uh, when they're dealing with vendors, they have uh, a record that that, uh, that tells them where to wire the money, what bank account to wire the money to for that vendor. And that's normally maintained by the, uh, the accounts payable clerk. So fairly low level in the organization. We've seen a lot, and this happens a lot, actually. I was talking to one of the students, this happened to his parents. Um, you'll get an email or a letter that looks like it's from that vendor. And it says, hey, I just want to let you know, not a big deal. But we changed from Wells Fargo, we're now with Bank of America. So could you, in the future, wire all of the money to our payments to the Bank of America account? And the account, the AP clerk, well, absolutely, it's, it's part of my job, and we'll, we'll change all the banking information. And so the next few bills that come in from that vendor, they're paid, but they're paid to the wrong person, right? And then, you know, three months, six months later, the real vendor says, hey, you haven't paid any of my bills for the last six months. I'm, I, I'm not, I'm not going to you know, continue working with you. And the company, well, what are you talking about? We're, we're current, right? And then they'll look and they'll see that the payment details got changed. That happens a lot. And it's a smart one because it's at the right level in the organization where it may not get any questions. It's not coming into the CFO, although maybe lots of CFOs would just you know, would sign off on it. But um, that's, a, that's one to watch out for. Um, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about intellectual property as well. I had one, um, one client that went public two years ago and uh, about, about six weeks before they went public, they had all of their data, all of their intellectual property source code sitting on a, a data repository that was managed by a third party. So basically all the most important information about the product is sitting on this server, um, along with lots of other companies' servers, this third party little company in San Francisco. And um, a criminal ring was siphoning off all of the data repositories like for over, over like three months, they took all of the data. So you're going public and you just find out that all of your source code is sitting in Eastern Europe. Someone stole it all. You still have it, but they have a, they have a copy. That's not a, that's not a good, um, that's not a good, uh, um, preparation for an IPO, right? Um, so they were using this third party. The third party had no controls. It was a very small startup company like the ones we just, you know, we just described. Um, and that almost, um, well, it delayed the IPO. I'm not going to say it, it, uh, it almost destroyed it. It didn't, but they had to put in a lot of disclosure. They had to talk to the SEC. They obviously had to change where their data was sitting. I mean, they were a SaaS company, so software as a service. So it'd be very hard for someone to actually take all that data, set up, a very similar company and operate the company because the whole point about SaaS is, right, you're developing it every day, right? So last month's product is not today's product, right? Not like a, not like a, um, a regular on-premise software company. So I did want to show this one. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> the vendor wanted to update yeah. accounting information. Um, didn't the clerk notice that the next month or whatever, so there's a monthly billing or something, should we know this fall? Well, they're paying them, right? They're, they're, all they're doing is paying the, the bill every month. The bill right. comes in. Right. Yeah. Some of the language. The state is the balance came up forward. In other words, I was supposed to pay you 100. I paid it to the wrong account. The well, people did that. So the ne next will uh, that 100. No, it's been, pay it's been paid, right? Well, it's not the banking details about you. They get their money. So when yeah, they tell me again, no, but the vendor doesn't. Yeah, I mean, the vendor's not going to realize immediately, right? Because you know, it's not unusual for people not to stick to the credit terms, right? Maybe they take an extra month or two months behind or three months behind. You would expect them to call, right? And that's how these things normally get discovered. I understand why the account clerk isn't aware. The key clerk isn't aware that the balance was paid off. Yeah. Get that village. It would show a balance. Oh, um, I'm just trying to, I'm oh, sorry, sorry. Doing an so, trying to figure out how well. Honestly, um, <laughs> so I, I, I don't think like many companies send statements anymore, right? 
because we used to, as on audit process, we would look at, at vendor statements, but we stopped doing that because, uh, yeah. But yeah, um, so this one I wanted to talk about. <clears throat> this is a real story. Um, we're talking about um, cyber crime, right? Um, so ubiquity networks, uh, Wi-Fi, small Wi-Fi um, networking product. Um, Ex-Apple employee, Robert Perra, uh, founded the company. It was actually my my client back in 2011 when they did an IPO, but it was it was not my client when this happened. Not to say that the, it, the result would have been any different if I'd been the audit partner, but um, they're very acquisitive. Um, they do a lot of business in uh, Asia, so they have um, an office in Taipei. They also have um, offices in on the mainland, and uh, they were doing a number of transactions, right? So think about buying companies, and so the CFO was sitting in his office one day. The CEO Robert was traveling hard to get hold of and um cfo gets this knows there's deals going on gets this email from i think it was the the law, third party law firm who they dealt with all the time saying um you know we need to wire money uh this afternoon into escrow otherwise this deal is not going to happen and so uh the cfo was unable to get hold of the ceo to confirm the you know the nature of the transaction the amount but he knew it was very urgent so um you know, we can all use 2020 hindsight, right? We weren't there, but but he wired the money. Um, so I think it was, I think it was actually like a $10 million wire. Um, and so if you're on the other side and you sent an email and you get $10 million, what are you going to do? You send another email? You went fishing for ten mil for some money. You got ten million. You're probably going to send another email. You guys all passed the ethics exam. I'm so pleased to see that. <laughs> um, you're going to send another email. So they did, right? They sent another thirteen emails, I think. Yeah, I think it was. was um, they sent a number of emails, and so he kept wiring money, right? Uh, and I think they got up to forty-seven, forty-seven million dollars wired out of the Hong Kong bank account, right? And then eventually the FBI um, stepped in and said, hey, we've noticed a lot of activity going on um, out of your uh, Hong, Kong, Hong Kong bank account. And we were noticing where it's going and we think those transactions could be fraudulent. And so they contacted the, the CFO, um, sorry, the CEO, contacted Robert. And I, and I believe that was the first time he was really aware that these transactions had happened. And so it's too late then, obviously, okay, the money's gone. I think they managed to get maybe, um, six million dollars back it was in process they really stopped that transaction so at the end of the day it was 40 million dollars in cold hard cash right over a few days um and this is a public company that has passed stocks controls right um so so this stuff can happen and so the way to avoid this is sort of have that sort of dual authentication you know so maybe with the benefit of hindsight what the cfo could have done was if he got an email he could have used text to verify the email he could have called to verify the email um and so that's what you know we recommend the clients but that that's happened in a number of places it's happened in a number of places you will never hear a lot because it's not material for those companies for these guys it was it was material it was a significant amount of money okay any questions on that you're all experts in fraud now um, yeah one. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, perhaps, you know, it seems like there's so many ways in which, I mean, especially with digital fraud that it can go down. So, do you recommend that the bank, I know it's not perfect, but the bank could avoid this is not like, somehow. Certainly, if I have pay to pay them, you have know, phone conversations. Yeah. What do you do with them? Like, you know, that, an email that you get. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. So, how do you avoid this with, with um, sort of, you know, digital, digital fraud? So, I think that's sort of two factor authentication. So, if you get an email, you should find another way to communicate with the sender, right? So text or yeah, you know, like a Zoom call, right? Zoom calls are much more common now than they were when this happened. So yeah, no, I agree. You'd, you'd find another way to make sure that that's a legit, legit transaction. So um, go to focus. Sorry, no. Stage does this type of like these decisions? When are they made? Are they made kind of like in the later stage expansion? Like when do you have these controls in place? You should have them as soon as possible. Yeah. yeah. So that's um, the whole thing about the phishing emails. As soon as you raise a round of financing and it's publicly disclosed, get ready, right? You're going to be you're going to be an avalanche of hey, um, you know, I need money for this, or you need to wire this, or the, the, I mean, so people are attuned to 
you know, where the money is, where the money is. Right? Um, so it's at every stage. Like my clients would, um, would we would go out and talk about this, um, that two factor uh, authentication approach to um, all of my clients. So early startups, even the ones that are getting ready to go public. And they're all like, oh yeah, Danny, we, we just got six of those emails. We know how to, we know how to deal with them, right? So they, they're coming in all the time. Um, so obviously there's more than four decisions that you should be involved in, right? I'm just gonna um, talk really quickly about four of them. So key metrics, key metrics, I'm gonna keep to the end. So skip over that. Revenue, we're gonna talk about uh, common stock valuation and taxes, right? Taxes should put everyone to sleep. Um, so the, the reason I'm gonna talk about um, these numbers are the, like their revenue is probably the most important number in the financial statements for a company that's a technology company, fast growing. You're not making any money. No one's expecting profits. Um, so then the first thing they're gonna look at is revenue. That's gonna be an indicator of the health of the company. Revenue is also one of those metrics that's used to benchmark valuation very commonly. Um, so there's this tendency, I wanna get revenue as big as possible, as fast as possible, right? Because it's going to benefit my valuation, right? Um, it's going to send out all the right signals that I'm a, I'm a really great, great investment opportunity, great company. Um, so we're going to we're going to look at revenue, different revenue models, and how it's really important to be involved in all of those discussions. Don't leave it to the accountants, right? Um, we'll talk about common stock. Highly important here, right? It's a massive piece of everyone's compensation, even today. Even with depressed valuations, um, I think I remember right that quarter Uber went public. I think they had a three point nine billion dollar compensation charge for common stock. Right, all of the options are vested. Um, so a huge, huge impact on the financial statements. Um, and then taxes. Everyone thinks I'm not making any money. I don't need to worry about tax. Right, it's we're not worried about income tax. We're worried about all the other taxes. Right. So we'll spend some time on that. So, so revenue first um, drives valuation. If you look at public companies, what's the one common number that they have when they're talking to the street? It's revenue, right? Almost every company has revenue uh, as a street expectation. You know, the market's expecting X revenue, X growth revenue. So even for, for um, public companies, very important. For private companies, important too. Um, if you're in certain industries, you're sort of constrained in terms of what your revenue model is. So I just mentioned SaaS companies, so software as a service. So that's a very that's a very ratable model. That's a subscription model, right? So if I sign you up for a three-year deal, million dollars a year, um, I'm going to recognize that evenly over the three years, right? Uh, um, so uh, very different from if I had a uh, if I had a, a software model where I'm licensing software and um, I sell you that license today, I'm recognizing all that revenue today, right? There's no spreading that over three years, right? I get that all today. So do I want a SaaS model where it's predictable, even? Do I want, do I want a um, software model where it's uh, very volatile, right? There's benefits to both. Because if I'm the last day of a quarter and I have a SaaS model and I need to move my revenue needle, it doesn't matter how many deals I sign, I'm just gonna get one 365th of the annual revenue. If I'm a software model, I can go out and sign 10 deals that day and I get all that revenue on the very last day of the quarter. That was the thing with a lot of these software companies. They did most of their business in the last two weeks of the quarter, right? And when customers knew, I'm not buying software, you know, until the last week of the quarter because I'm going to get a great deal because they're going to be struggling to hit their revenue targets. Um, so models are, are very important. Um, so cloud is ratable. Licensing is lumpy. I call it lumpy and unpredictable. Um, and then we have this whole host of companies now, which I'm calling platform or marketplace companies, Uber, platform company, Airbnb, you know, platform company, Lyft, platform company. Um, we can go, go down the list, you know, Poshmark, all platform companies. And I'll explain what that means, DoorDash, platform company. Um, okay, so we're going to look at an example, right? This one always makes me hungry. You know, I know what I'm having for lunch. Okay, so... Um, Pizza, right? So Pizza Hut, there's there's uh, how pizza was ordered the old way, right? So Pizza Hut, there's a receipt, not mine. Um, get a pizza for 28, 28 bucks, swipe my credit card. They come and they deliver the pizza. Um, this company, uh, Pizza Hut, I can't remember the name of the parent company, so it owns a whole bunch of brands. Um, but um, they will recognize the revenue when they've met their performance obligation to the company, 
which is when you deliver that pizza, right? So I call, I want a pizza, order my pizza, they deliver it. As soon as they deliver it, that's a revenue event for them. They get that whole $28.09, $28 right? Um, and here's their terms and conditions, right? We'll give you, we aim to provide you with your ordered products as close as possible to your request of delivery collection time. You agree to accept delivery of the pizza at the agreed time and place, and they're done. As soon as you, as soon as they give you that pizza, risk in the product will pass to the customer with delivery. So delivery for them is the trigger for revenue recognition, right? As soon as they deliver, that's their performance obligation. What are they, what are they obliged to do when you call up? Deliver the pizza, okay? Um, so they have to wait until they deliver the pizza, and then they can recognize all of that revenue, right? They're responsible for everything. So if we think of DoorDash, right? So a totally different model, right? Um, transaction value is slightly different, okay? Uh, $25. But DoorDash is just the merchant of record. It's one of these platform companies, right? So we're going to look at what their performance obligations are. Um, it's handling the entire, the entire 25. It kind of feels like you're dealing with Pizza Hut. You know, you go online, you order it, you have to put in for your credit card details, and it kind of feels like the same experience. But it has a totally different um, uh, consequence from an accounting point of view. So if we look at their terms and conditions, I'm not going to drag you through all of this, right? But um, well, we'll go through the important part. What are they agreeing to do? DoorDash provides a technology platform connecting you with independent restaurants, right? So they're telling you, we're, we're not the restaurant, right? We just have this platform. And all we're doing is making a connection between you and the restaurant. That's our job. It's not like Pizza Hut where we're making the pizza and, and delivering it to you, right? Um, they're even calling the they even call the restaurants um, independent uh, independent food providers. They're merchants, right? And independent third party contractors who provide delivery services. Those are the dashers, right? So what's DoorDash telling you they're doing? We're just connecting you with a restaurant, and we're going to connect you with the driver, right? That's all we do, right? Um, it says here, just in case you you didn't get it, like DoorDash does not prepare the food, does not prepare the food. Our offer the delivery services, right? Has no responsibility for the dasher drinking your milkshake before you know you you, you get it. Um, DoorDash is not in the del delivery business, right? It's providing this technology platform, facilitating the transmission of orders between you and the merchants, i.e. the restaurants um, and the the uh, contractors, right? So a whole bunch of legalese, and uh, there's a reason for that. So it has, that has a, a dramatic impact on how the revenue gets recognized. Um, they're acting, so one, one word we want to take away from this is they're acting as an agent. They're not a principal in the transaction. They're an agent in the transaction, right? So if we look at their, um, if we look at that $25, right, um, how does that revenue get split up? Well, DoorDash, it's not getting the whole $25, right? It's getting a basic commission. I sort of estimated 15%, right? Um, for delivery and 6%, if, if you do pickup at 6%, plus they're, they're getting a service fee. So the service fee here of $1.50. Because they're not doing the whole thing, right? All they're doing is connecting you to a restaurant, connecting you to a driver. So the restaurant gets the subtotal less the commissions that are withheld. The driver gets the delivery fee and the driver tip, right? And the franchise tax board gets the sales tax, right? So that's how that $25 gets split up. So if we look at revenue, um, that's the total value of the transaction. That $25 on that receipt times the number of transactions is this $24 billion, right? That's the whole, that's the whole amount of um, transactions that are going through DoorDash, right? But that's not what their revenue is because their terms and conditions don't entitle them to all of that revenue, right? If they said, we take responsibility for the pizza, right? We're responsible for delivery of the pizza. Then they would book this as revenue, this 24 billion, right? They, their, their revenue for that same year was 2.9 billion. Not shabby, but not 24.6 not or 24.7 billion. And uh, the reason for that is their performance obligation is totally different to the performance obligation that Pizza Hut had. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and so think about Uber, right? Uber doesn't keep the entire fare, right? It's the same principle. They're acting as an agent. Same accounting principle with an LE, right? They're, they're acting as an agent, not as a principal. 
Um, think about Airbnb, hosts and guests. Did you have a question? Okay. Um, I know I'm doing a lot of that. So, so you can see uh, one of the things we actually did with Uber when we when we started working with them is we we had we had to recraft their terms and conditions that were on their website to make sure it lined up with what they wanted their revenue model to be, right? So um, a lot of companies, uh, I think companies are much more focused on this now, but maybe ten years ago they, they were less focused on what they were saying on the website and marrying that up with what the revenue model was. Now they're doing a much better job. So when you're thinking about revenue models, you need to be at the table on this one and having the conversation. Maybe you want, maybe you want to have the 24.7 billion as revenue, right? Your gross margin would be much lower, right? It would, it would end up being 2.9. Maybe you rather have the, the, the lower revenue number and a much higher gross margin, right? And you can tweak all of this just by changing the terms and conditions and the way you operate the business. But you don't want to be um, there like a week before the IPO and find out, oh, we're not booking the 24.7 billion as our revenue. How come the CFO never told me, right? And at, at that point, it's too late. But um, so definitely a conversation like you, you need to be having with the team, right? The whole team needs to be involved in this and everyone needs to understand um, how those terms and conditions, performance obligations, we call them in the accounting world, um, how they're going to dictate your revenue, your revenue model. Um, a good example is Apple, you know, the 30% Apple keeps from developers. Um, how many people think Apple is the principal in that transaction or the agent? Agent? It's the agent, right? Why is it the agent? You would think Apple wants that revenue. No way. Apple doesn't want a, a product that's got a 30% margin, right? It doesn't want the $100 up here as revenue. And seventy dollars is cost of revenue, and thirty dollars is as uh, as margin. That would make their margin thirty percent. That would drag down their entire corporate margins. They're happy sacrificing the revenue and having that thirty percent margin at almost a hundred percent, right? That thirty percent just drops all to the gross margin line. Um, so that's not by accident, right? That's the way they've structured those um, those agreements with developers. And when you think about all like it's you you when you're when you're buying that. Um, application, whatever you're buying on, you're, you're on the app store, right? Apple's got your credit card information. You're a customer of Apple. I think everyone thinks, oh, that's, I'm, the, Apple's, the, Apple's the, uh, the principal in this transaction, but they structured those agreements so that they kept the, the high margin and uh, sacrificed the revenue, which was obviously a smart, smart thing to do in hindsight. So common stock, um, really important. It's a compensation strategy, obviously, right? So you want to get this right. Um, uh, like one of the best inventions uh, that that uh, was ever was ever made for for technology companies, because you save cash, right, and you give stock instead, right, which is non cash. At some point, it's cash, but it's not your cash, right. So you give a stock award, employee exercises the award, has shares, sells those shares in the market. Somebody else buys them and is paying is paying the employee for those shares. So they get compensated, but it's not, you're not using your cash, right? You're just using your equity. So it's a great tool, has all sorts of tax benefits. You don't, I, I mean, from in the most part, um, you don't end up paying anything until you sell it. And then you have the money to pay the tax, right? There are exceptions, but um, very favorable tax treatment. So like a great invention. Um, there are some restrictions that go with it. The, the value, and I'll walk you through this, the value that you assign to the stock you're giving has to be determined by a third party. You can't come up with a value yourself, right? Because otherwise you'd probably pick a really low value. Um, and, uh, you know, that way reduce any sort of future tax um, on, the, on the employee. Um, so you have to have this independent valuation expert. Lots of companies will do these reports, 49A report, at least once a year. Um, so let me quickly just run through what a stock option looks like, and then I'll explain why it's, um, I'm sure I'm not doing well on time, right? Um, so stock option um, gives you the option to buy the stock, right? So it's like any other option agreement. Um, normally, it's uh, it, it'll, the option is good for 10 years. So as long as you're um, still an employee at the company, you can exercise the option. If you leave the company, although this has changed now, but if you leave the company, you generally look the option dies within 90 days, right? If you haven't exercised it within 90 days, it goes away. Some companies have changed that now to... So like Pinterest changed it, some other companies followed suit, Sana. Um, but they have value, right? Because if I get my option at five dollars, 
and the stock price goes up to 15, well, that's great. I know I'm going to, at some point, I'm going to exercise that option, pay five, get stock for 15. I made a $10 profit, right? Um, their value of using one of the most common methods is the Black Scholes method, and it has all of these inputs, right? Underlying stock price, which we're going to look at, exercise price, which is typically equal to the underlying stock price on the day of the option. Then you have to come up with a period that you're holding it for. You put something in for volatility, risk-free interest rate, dividend rates normally zero because these companies don't pay dividends. So if I just use these assumptions, my stock is worth $10 because I went and I got that 49A valuation report. They told me $10 is the, the price of my stock. So I grant this, I grant the option at $10. Um, I think I think the employee is going to hold the option for six years before the exercise. So I put six in here. I'm not paying any dividends. I'm going to use a volatility assumption of 50%, risk-free interest rate, probably a little bit higher now, about 1.5. I push the button. And so for every option I give, I have a compensation cost that I need to record in the financial statements for four for four four dollars and eighty-four cents, right? So when you think that 20% of your fully loaded shares are kept for as a compensation tool for employees, that's a massive number, right? That's why Uber had 3.9 billion in stock comp. That's why Twitter after went public, I think at 159 million charge in one quarter, then 169 million charge in the next quarter. These are huge numbers. They're non-cash, but they're very large numbers. So they affect your profitability. And you can see <clears throat> these, they're very sensitive, right? So if I just change this assumption and say, hey, they're going to hold it for an extra year, and my volatility is actually higher than I thought, look at the, the price of that, that how, how expensive that is. I mean, it's non cash, but now every time I issue a stock option, I've got seven, $7.78 of compensation expense I need to record. So these are, these are massive. So you need to be involved in these decisions, right? Because they're going to have a massive impact on your financial statements, particularly this one here, right? How do I come up with that stock price? And um, there's generally three ways. And like CEOs, executive teams, the companies need to be involved in these conversations. You do a discounted cash flow, a public company market multiple, or recent financing or transaction. You can use one of those. You can use two of those. You can use all three and just weight them, right? So um, DCF is just they call it income approach. So you're, now you're doing forecasts, right? Through a very sophisticated FP&A department. They'll come up with these forecasts. You'll do a, a cash flow forecast, and then you'll discount it back to present value today. And so that one says the company's worth 12.8 12 point, 12 .8 million, right? Um, most, so forecasts are hard for private companies because you don't have a lot of historical track record. So it's, uh, they're, always hard, they're always hard for me to audit them, but they're hard to come up with. This is a much more common method. So you'll find um, five public companies that look like you, like you want to be like, um, and you'll figure out from publicly available data what their, um, what their valuation is based on. So you'll take their enterprise value divided by sales. That gives you a multiple. Remember I said revenues uh, used as a benchmark for valuing companies? It's exactly what I meant here. So you could then say, okay, well, my, the companies that I think I'm like, they're valued at 2.2 times revenue. I know my revenue, so I'll just value myself at 2.2 times my revenue, right? And so this is probably the most common method that's used. I mean, I'm using a very simple example here, but if you're trying to figure out the value of your company, maybe, maybe market multiples is a good one, right? You can do EBITDA, you can do price earnings. Um, and then the last one is a recent transaction. So again, this is super, super uh, simple. So you just got a $5 million investment, right? You gave up 20% of your company. So you just do some simple math. My company is now worth 25, 25 million, right? I could use that, right? So if you just did a recent round of investment, um, private, private company startups will, will tend to use this, right? Because this is good evidence, right? You know, probably maybe five different VCs invested in that 5 million. And so you have five parties that weren't connected with the company that think the company was worth $20 million, $20 million before, you know, before they invested. So this is probably, uh, of those three methods, this is the easiest, obviously, if you've done a recent round of financing. If you haven't done a recent round of financing, then go find companies that look like you, figure out what they're trading at, use the market multiple. And then if you don't like any of those multiples, then you know, invest in a crystal ball and you know, FP&A department and come up with a, with a cash flow forecast. 
So those three things, um, you will you will end up with a with a valuation for the entire company, and then you get you're trying to get to the value of one share of common stock. So you know when we went back here, we're trying to get to this ten dollars. So there's a process that I'm not I'm not going to walk you through, but you'll take that enterprise value that you ended up with, and then you have to um, subtract all of the preferred shares that you give to VCs, and you end up with here's what. You know, you'll use some assumptions about discount for lack of marketability, and you'll end up with a um, with a private company. You'll end up with that ten dollar value, and so you get a big report from a valuation firm. And so if the IRS ever challenges you, you're like, here, we you know we used um, Anderson Valuation, and so we gave them some information, but we're we're good on this. We have safe harbor uh, from you. Um, so taxes, I'll just do real quick. Um, three things you need to worry about in taxes: sales tax withholding taxes, and then some things on income tax generally to do with international structuring, but um, sales tax. So if you were in, if, if we were having this conversation five years ago and you were purely a California company um, and you had no presence in any other state, you might have customers there, but you like, you don't have an office in Texas. You don't have a salesperson in Connecticut, right? Um, then you were only filing one sales tax report in California. There was a case called the wafer case that changed, um, put that on its head basically. And it said, we don't care about physical presence anymore. We're a digital economy. And by the way, you know, states really want tax revenue. So we are going to just say, if you have customers in a state, you have a preference in the state. It doesn't need to be a physical presence anymore. You're operating in our state. You need to pay a sales tax. So you went from California to multiple states overnight, right? So if you don't register and pay sales tax where you're supposed to be paying, the consequences are pretty dramatic, right? So um, penalties and interest are huge, right? And I've seen it um, delayed a couple of IPOs for me. Um, and also where you where it comes up is in M&A. So I, I could probably do an M&A uh, diligence review on any company and find um, errors in their sales tax filings. And then I would leverage that. I would say, oh, look, I run the numbers. If, if you know, if you had done what you should have done, you would you have a liability for two million dollars in uh, North Dakota, right? Um, and uh, we want two million dollars off the purchase price, right? That's that's where this generally comes to play. So if you're well prepared, and your response to that is, we did it, we did a sales tax analysis. We're actually registered in every state we think we're in. So you know, no, you're not getting two million dollars off the purchase price, right? So. It's very important, not just uh, if you're an ongoing business, but also on a, um, you know, if you're in an M&A situation, guarantee it's the first thing that's going to be on the due diligence list as a problem, sales, sales tax. So you don't want it to be a problem, right? You don't want to have that issue come up at the last minute. So if you're a company that operates in multiple states, you need to have licenses in multiple states. Um, not you want licenses, but you should be registered for tax. There are thresholds in every state, to be perfectly honest. Um, so if your business is, is below that threshold, you don't need to be, right? But you need to get professional. My point is here: you need professional help. I can't. Uh, I can't tell you what the sales tax rules are in every state and every jurisdiction. You need to get you know professionals involved. So the um, the second one here, um, withholding. So let me give you an example. So um, I'm going to use a public company example. Udemy. You familiar with Udemy? Learning platform. Right. They have authors or instructors. Right. Um, are they employees of Udemy? No, they're not. Right. They're what are called independent contractors, right? So um, if I'm if I'm working with independent contractors and I'm a company, I need to ask the independent contractor, please give me your W-9 tax form, which proves that you have an income tax number and you're registered, which means I don't need to worry about income tax for you because you're just a contractor. You're going to be dealing with income tax on yourself. I don't need to treat you as an employee for income tax purposes. If you don't get a W-9 form, they're your problem, right? So there are many companies. Um, so I, 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 I'm using Udemy as an example just because it's an easy one. So instructors, um, hosts on Airbnb, um, many different platforms where if you're using contractors to deliver services to your customers, you need to make sure that your, your tax is totally buttoned up. So um, here's Udemy's um, IPO disclosure. Um, and these, these slides, I think, will be in Canvas, right? So um, they didn't get the W-9s, right? which meant that um, 
the IRS is like, well, we're not going after 10,000 instructors, right? We're just going to come to you because it was your responsibility. You didn't get a W-9 from that instructor. Therefore, you are responsible for their income tax for all those years that they were earning money on your platform. You owe us a check for $17 million. Right? If you had had a CFO that knew about this issue, or now you know about it, right? If you were at the table when you were talking about uh, withholding taxes and how you were structuring your business, you would have just saved yourself $17 million. And there are companies with much, much bigger numbers than this, right? Um, but again, it's it's like my point here is when you see tax, like your eyes just shouldn't glaze over and you turn off, right? This is these are big, big dollars, right? And the reason they're so big is because no one pays attention to them until it's too late, right? And then they grow. And the taxing authorities are really good at penalties, right? They will double the rate. I saw someone that screwed up their option plan and uh, Basically, they owed the, the employees, right? Obviously, the company had to step in and pay it, but um, they ended up owing not just tax at 35%, they were being taxed at like 85%, and by the way, interest on top of that. And we want it right now. Right? And they got. Uh, I mean, W9? Yeah. W9 is, the, w is the, the contractor will have the W9, the company he would then issue a 1099. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Once they get the W nine, and so the IRS is like they will match both of those things up, right? But they'll have people that, that do that. Um, so I just wanted to go on. Uh, we could spend like a whole class on this one, but I wanted to just to just to go show you this example, which is um, uh, an issue for internet. This is actually I got a call last week on this, um, so I thought it was worth just talking about. So when you set up a company internationally, right? Um, those companies generally don't have any revenue, right? Maybe there are 10 people there, right? And you haven't generated revenue yet, just want a presence, right? Um, but the taxing authorities in those countries are like, come on, like we need, we need a little bit, otherwise you can structure this any way you want, you'd never pay tax. We need a little bit of profit in that entity, right? And we'll tax you on that profit. And so those are called cost plus arrangements. So if I'm a, if I'm a, a UK sub, uh, no revenue yet in the UK, but I'm using um, I'm using parent company, right? They're they're providing a lot of resources, so they're sending me a bill for um, the cost of what they're providing, and I have to mark that up by ten percent. So whatever whatever my cost is, it's going to add ten percent. That's going to be my revenue. I have a tiny little bit of profit in that country. I'm going to pay I'm going to pay income tax on that. The IRS in the UK is going to be super happy, right? And we'll just go on our merry way. So. Um, so this one's actually, I, I did get this call last week, in fact. And so um, one of the biggest expenses, we talked about stock-based comp, with 3.9 billion for Uber, and you know, we could go through the list. Um, the, the US company will take a portion of that stock-based comp because it, it applies to the UK um, employees too, and pass it over to the UK and say, hey, we have a $30 million of stock comp. You, your share is three, right? So now I have a cost of $3 million, right? I have to add 10% onto that. So my revenue is 3.3 million. I have a profit of 300K. I'm going to pay tax on that. So this is actually, <clears throat> numbers are fairly um, similar to the, the conversation I had. So my rep, my, my cost, all stock-based comp, I had 10%. I have revenue of 3.3 3 million. I have a profit of $300,000. I have to pay tax on that. But the problem in the UK is, and a lot of countries, for tax purposes, this is not my tax return. I put my revenue on there. My costs have disappeared because the UK is like, we're not giving you a tax deduction for that. Right. You, know, you can have your $3 million cost in your gap financials, but in terms of our tax return, it's zero. So now I had to pay tax at the UK's rate last year of 19%. And so this company actually wrote a check for, I think it was like half a million pounds, right? And um, that's gone, gone out, the, gone out the window. And uh, they were talking to me and I'm like, well, it seems like, a, like, like three. I understand the concept and the disallowance, that all makes sense, but three, three million dollars for stock-based comp, that just seems like a lot for 10 people. How did you value the options? And we were just talking about valuing options. So the CFO got it totally wrong, right? So the CFO, valued the options at $3 million. The real number was $300,000, right? 
Yeah, he totally screwed it up. He'd taken, you know, that option value, that 484, should have used that. Instead of, instead of that, he used the $10, right? And he put that, that 484 gets spread over four years, the vesting period. He put it all in the first year. So two mistakes, right? And what they should have paid was $62,700, right? And they paid um, 10 times as much, right, almost. Now, I mean, the good news is you can file, uh, you know, uh, uh, you can refile the return, but it's going to be a year before you get that money again, right? And if they hadn't had the conversation with us, they would never have known that, right? That money was gone forever. The IRS isn't. The IRS doesn't know that the that the the three million dollars is wrong, right? They're not looking at the the four nine A valuation report. So again, my point in this is um, is really just. Like you see how important these deci these decisions can be, and like the, the the magnitude of making the wrong decision. So just by getting a little bit of professional advice and input, how you can save yourself um, so much pain and suffering. Not to mention just the the dollars. Um, so that was ta that was taxes, and then IPOs. I'll go through this really quickly because there aren't any IPOs, but. Um, I, I would say to my clients, they would say, like, what do we need for an IPO? And I would say, you need substantive revenues. This number changes all the time, 150 million plus, right? Um, you need to have a good revenue growth rate, 30% is on the low side, to be honest. Um, so your revenue should be growing every year. Predictability and visibility in the results, because there's no point in going public if you're going to get trashed the first quarter and you come out of the gates, right? So you need to be able to forecast your business, understand what it's going to do. Um, ideally, you have positive cash flow. If not positive, your EBITDA is positive. So you're getting there. You're kind of, you're going to be spitting out positive cash flow. You stop burning cash flow. I've had clients that met none of these, by the way, I don't know I'm public, but typically this would be part of the selling story. And then, you know, some sort of unique value proposition, which um, makes sense, right? You want to, you don't want to be just a me too um, company. So uh, this is the IPO timeline. Um, so you start like really you start about a year in advance putting everything together. Um, this is a checklist that I would normally talk to clients about. So corporate governance, you need to get an independent board, audit committee chairs, you know, chairs of the compensation committee, um, whistleblower programs we talked about, charters. Again, all of that side, lawyers help with that, get that put in place. You need to go through the management team, and that CFO that got you to, you know, um, 100 million dollars of revenue is probably not the CFO that's going to get you to a building, right? So you need to really um, take a hard look at the top management tier. And uh, you'll see a lot of changes like in the 12 months before an IPO. Generally, VP of sales, you get an industry veteran in who's done this you know, 10 times. Um, and then they, you know, they bring people with them. Um, CFO sometimes changes. G, uh, the general counsel typically always changes. Right? You bring in a really serious GC, really good lawyer, good attorney. Start acting like a public company. Uh, sometime out, uh, very expensive. So there, there are the costs. I just want to point out accountants are cheaper than lawyers. Um, got printing costs, underwriters with their standard commission, you know, 6% on that deal, a deal that size. And then you have all the system stuff you need to do. Upgrade the financial systems, um, hard close, practice all the reporting and investor relations stuff. You got to worry about internal controls now because you're a public company. Um, if you want to touch on uh, key metrics really quickly, and you'll see why these are important. I'm, I'm going to use uh, DoorDash. Okay, DoorDash. Um, so key metrics, this is something you'll talk to the market about. So um, not necessarily purely financial, but um, every time you report your earnings as a public company, you'll start off with the key metrics, and then you'll start with the gap financials. So in DoorDash's case, it's total, total orders. So uh, 1.4 billion orders almost. Um, Marketplace GOV, gross order value. Remember that number that we saw, the 24.7 billion? That's that number, right? So you can see there that's growing considerably, right? And then they have a measure, not a gap measure, it's called contribution profit or loss. Um, and then they have adjusted EBITDA. So those are their key metrics. That's what they will talk about. You once you once you pick a key metric, it's really hard to get rid of it, right? Because when you start talking to the street about key metrics and uh, maybe something not showing a good trend. And you drop it, then the street's like, "Hey, you dropped that. Well, what's what, like, what's going on?" Um, and generally, you're dropping it because it's trending adversely. So you need to think about key metrics really carefully. What am I prepared to keep disclosing? 
maybe maybe also what are my competitors disclosing? Um, and so DoorDash here, they, they spell out what everything is here. So in their filings, you can see this contribution profit. It's kind of like that variable um, contribution. Um, they divine uh, adjusted EBITDA. So all of this gets disclosed every quarter you can see, right? So you can see some nice trends there. Um, and they obviously put a lot of thought into picking those key metrics, felt comfortable with those for the long term. But they should be specific to the business, but you can, you can see you have to be wedded to something that you're comfortable with. And so as a, as a leader in the company, or even just a, one, of, one of the executive team, you, you should be you know, at the table when you're discussing key metrics. Um, because even if I'm responsible for sales, like you can see, you know, I'm going to be impacted by, mar am I comfortable with marketplace gross order value um, being, a, being a key metric? Um, and then this last slide, just like what I've seen in terms of, you know, I'll call them mistakes, but, you know, definitely, definitely not mortal, but like leaving it too late to invest in the accounting um, organization. You know, you could have a sales tax issue, you could have a withholding tax issue. Could screw up the way you've structured your international subsidiaries, the way you've done the valuation. So you need to have a professional CFO on board, um, and then you need to be part of that discussion too. Um, not dealing timely with the tax issue, getting really good uh, uh, audit committee board members really helps. Right, they've done it a, a, a vast number of times. Um, leaving it too long to invest in systems to support um, to support the growth in the business, and then like going public. Just to go public, like going public before you're ready is never, never a good, never a good recipe. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. I know it's um, a little bit late. Any, any last question uh, before we adjourn? Okay. So guys, we will see you on Wednesday. Uh, we'll pick up where we left off on chapter 11. And uh, one more hand for Danny. Thank you very much.